Thank you, Lord, for Mike this morning. We thank you for the word that you've given him for us this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that he would speak it, Lord, with boldness as your spirit leads. And we thank you this morning, Lord, that the word that you've sent, Lord, will accomplish everything that you've sent it forth to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Got the mind of a 29-year-old and the body of a 29-year-old plus four decades and two. <laughs> but God is good. Nothing greater than to preach and in the first service see someone to come to Christ on your birthday. Amen. God is good. It's what it's all about. This morning I want to share with you God's ultimate act of love. Let me say that again. God's ultimate act of love. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Ephesians 1, verse 3 through verse 14. Some people say I have an accent. I don't think so. I think I sound normal. Everybody else has an accent. But it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reaches their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Father, we thank you that you chose and gave the ultimate act of love, the gift of your son. We thank you, Father, that you had a plan. Before the foundation of the world, you had a plan of redeeming mankind. And you predestined all mankind to come to you. But out of your goodness, you gave us a free will to choose. And Father, I thank you that today, as we look at your word and we look at your actions, we can see that you are a good God, filled with love. Father, we bless you this morning. I pray that we will have ears to hear, hearts to understand, and strengthen us in the area of our will that we can embrace your truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. It's in our most difficult times we must know and believe that God is working for our good. It's crucial to understand that God loves me. In fact, just turn to your neighbor and say to them, God loves me. 
Say it like you mean it. I hope I, I don't think I heard anybody say God loves you. <laughs> but you see, God loves the world. God doesn't want any to perish. And he's busy transforming us into a loving church with a culture of love that will manifest his love through our life's actions. There's nothing we can do to gain his love. His love is unchanging because God is unchanging. We are loved completely and at all times by God. He is in a covenant with us and the word covenant means abandoning the right to give up. God has abandoned the right to give up on loving us. God loves mankind. And when God says he's not willing for any to perish, he actually means it. In John 3, verse 16 and 17, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God's ultimate act of love was to send his son, Jesus, to redeem mankind. Jesus came willingly. In fact, Jesus said, no one takes my life, I give it. In Romans 5, verse 7 and 8, it says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we all deserve punishment because we all fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus came and he died in our place. He took our punishment upon himself. He then presents us faultless before the Father. And we stand in his righteousness in fact, when we stand in his righteousness, the Bible says it's just as if we've never sinned. Romans 3 verse 22 says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You see, salvation is an act of faith. Believing Jesus died, that he rose again, that's what we're celebrating today. He ascended on high, and he's seated next to God, interceding on our behalf, rooting for our success. If you know anything about intercession, when you intercede, you pray until the burden is lifted or victory comes. And can you imagine that Jesus is praying for you, for your success and your victory in life? I remember one time I had a dream, and in this dream, somebody held my hand. I didn't know who it was. And I walked through this massive gate, and the gate swung open, and it was a huge Colosseum stadium. And as I walked in, I was ushered into an area of the stadium. It was just packed with people. But they were the most joyous people and smiling people. But as I looked across that stadium, I saw my father, and I saw my grandmother. And my first thought was, God must be preparing me to let me know I'm going to die because they've passed on and gone to, to be with him. And I said, Lord, are you letting me know that I'm going to die? And he said, no, 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 no. Look over the side. Look at what they're cheering. And as I looked over the side, I looked on the playing field. The only person I saw on the playing field was me. And the Lord said, this is that great cloud of witnesses that are surrounding you cheering you on as I intercede and I pray for your success. I want to share some examples of God's intent to redeem mankind even when he passes judgment. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 6 through 7, it's a story of Cain. We know the story of Cain and Abel and how that God received Abel's offering and he didn't accept Cain's offering and Cain was upset about it. But imagine this, God comes down and in verse 6 it says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. 
Now that doesn't contradict God's word. You see, he says, we will never be tempted beyond what we can bear. In other words, God will always make an avenue of escape. Therefore, it is always, sin is always a choice by us. Oh, you got very quiet on that one. You see, the phrase that so many people like and so many people say, the devil made me do it is hogwash. If you sin, you've chosen to violate the word of God. How about Abraham? In Genesis 18, we've heard a lot about that over the past few weeks. God was sent his angels to pronounce judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And here, he allows Abraham to negotiate with him. God, if there's 50, will you spare it? Or 40, or 30, or 20, or 10. And God, even at 10, was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah. But we know that God couldn't find 10 righteous people in Sodom. But yet, he spared Lot and his family because they were righteous before their God. In Numbers chapter 2, there's a, a false prophet by the name of Balaam. And he's got issues with Israel. And people hire him to prophesy a curse over Israel. And God kind of gets fed up with him. And he actually sends an angel to destroy him. He pronounces judgment upon Balaam. And he's determined that that angel that he sends is going to kill him. But yet in God's mercy, in God's compassion, God enables a donkey to speak with the hope that Balaam would repent. And we know the story that Balaam repented because a donkey got his attention. That's the God that loves you and I with a love that passes all understanding. There's also the story of Jonah. Jonah got angry with God. He didn't want Nineveh to be saved. He didn't want to go preach a message and hope that they would turn to God. Because you see, they were a vile community. Every time about harvest time, they would come and they would raid Israel. and They would steal their crops and steal their children and their women and different things. Jonah wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. He thought, oh, praise God. God's going to destroy it. But then he began to rationalize and begin to think of what God is like. So he gets on a ship bound for Tarshish, going to a different direction. And God's still out of his mercy, even for Jonah. He allows a storm to take place. And then Jonah is asleep. They, they figure, why is this man sleeping when we're terrified? And he says, well, it's because I disobeyed God. And he says, just throw me overboard. We know the story. They threw him overboard and God had prepared a whale. The whale swallowed him up. I think Jonah's olive coloring of the Middle East probably was a little tarnished from all the acidity in the stomach of that whale. When he got barfed up on the beach, says he made it to Nineveh. It was a three-day journey. He made it in a day. But he preached. And the whole city, the king, down to the animals, they fasted and they repented. We know the story. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah prays this prayer and he says to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why, that's what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. God in his mercy spared Nineveh because they turned another direction back towards God. And Jonah, he's upset. He goes out of the city sits under a palm tree, he's angry with God, and in the night God allows that palm tree to shrivel up. And Jonah's even more angry the next day. And God speaks to Jonah and says, Jonah, you're more concerned with this palm tree which you had nothing to do with than this city of 120,000 people. 
Wow. And God gives us a definition of how he perceives sin. He said this to Jonah. Jonah, these people just don't know their right hand from their left. You see, we're pretty self-righteous. We categorize sin. Oh, that's a little sin. Oh, you do that, that's a little bit more. Oh, you kill somebody, that's really bad. You do this or you do that. I want you to know, to God, sin is sin to God. There are no little white lies. A lie is a lie. A lie is sin. How about the woman caught in adultery? In the very act. And they're all standing around and they're saying, stoner, stoner. They all picked up stones. And it says in the story that Jesus knelt down and began to write things in the sand. I wonder if he highlighted some of the different sins to some of the men, maybe wrote their name beside the sin, where eventually Jesus looks and says to the woman, where are your accusers? Then he says, neither do I condemn you. You see, Jesus never came to condemn the world, but to redeem the world. God will create a fix to fix you. In my own life, I was on a flight from Cork, Ireland to Edinburgh, but we ended up flying to Exeter and I had to change planes. There was a mechanical problem or something. But on my flight from Cork to Exeter, England, I was in 2B, but on that airline, Irish airline, 2B starts in the first row. Sounds like an Irish airline, doesn't it? If you're Irish, I'm sorry. But the next flight, I was 2B, so I just sat in the first row again, not realizing that I'd sat in the wrong seat. But a very dignified lady came in, and she was in a business suit, and she sat down next to me. And uh, after a while, she says, oh, I notice that you're reading the book of Jonah. That's one of my favorite books. I said, really? She goes, oh, I, I perceive you're an American. I said, yes, I am. She goes, did you just come from America now? And I said, no, I actually flew up from South Africa. She goes, oh, I used to live in South Africa. I go, really? So did I. She goes, I used to live in a Christian community, thinking that would get some brownie points. And I said, really? So did I. She goes, yes, I lived in one in East London. And I, I go, really? So did I. She goes, what's your name? And I told her, she goes, I've heard of you. I said, what's your name? She told me I heard of her, but I didn't tell her I heard of her. She asked me what I was perceiving and seeing in South Africa. And I just told her the things I was seeing God do. Then she was silent for about 15 minutes and we landed in Edinburgh as I was getting off the plane. She tapped me on the shoulder. She said, I've got some skeletons in my closet in South Africa and today you've put faith in my heart that I can deal with them. You know, it was almost 25 years to the day. She was the personal assistant to the director of a ministry in East London and she ran off with a friend of mine. He left his wife and family and the two of them, they left their families. They ran off together to Exeter, England. The Bible says we're to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. You see, what I perceived as a mistake on my part, God was creating a situation to fix somebody after 25 years. That's the God that we serve. He wants to redeem mankind. Psalm 103, verse 10, it says, God not, does not treat us as our sin deserves or repay us according to to our iniquities. God means what he says when he doesn't want anybody to perish. In 1 John 4, verse 16, it says, God is love. What can compare? He is the very essence of all that love is. In fact, in Exodus 20, verse 6, it says, God shows love to a thousand generations of those who love him and will keep his commandments. Can you imagine that? To 40,000 years. Will any of you live that long? God's love will transcend all of our lives. That speaks 
of an eternal love that transcends time. Psalms 21 verse 7 says, For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Are you shaken in life because you fail to realize that God is in control and that God loves you? And he's going to bring good out of every situation that you face? Psalm 25 says, According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. God is good. Say that to your neighbor. God is good. You see, we need to say it till we actually believe it. Often it's just intellectual understanding that God is good. You might think, that hasn't been my experience. 1 John 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. I love that. If you've received Christ into your heart, you are born into the family of God. You're one of his children. Friday night, Christian, my grandson, spent the night with me. Over, well, my wife's been gone. He's been a godsend just to, to bless me. You know, my time gets preoccupied with him. He loves gummy bears and stuff. Loves coming to grandpa because he knows he'll get some gummy bears. But we were at McDonald's yesterday morning having breakfast and we were waiting for Christo to meet us to pick him up. And where we were at, we were sitting in the corner of McDonald's and it was a plate glass window, but we could see out, but nobody could see in. And he was just watching and looking for his dad to drive up. And when he saw his dad's car, he jumped up and said, there's dad. He ran to the window and said, dad, dad, but his dad couldn't hear him through the window. And eventually after a while, because his dad wasn't hearing him, he began to pound on the window and his dad turned and looked, but he didn't see him yet. But as soon as he came into McDonald's, he ran to his daddy and threw his arms around him. God wants us as his children to love him in that exact same manner. That we love him with every fabric of our being. You see, God wants us to be a church of love. He's busy changing our culture to a heavenly culture. For us to love like God loves, he wants us to love him with every fabric of our being heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love him unconditionally, love, and love ourselves, and then manifest his love through us to the world. He doesn't want us hating Putin. He doesn't want us hating the Muslims. He wants us to pray for them and trust God to redeem them, that God will fix a fix to fix them. Why? Because God loves them so much he doesn't want them to even perish no matter how bad they are to you or to I. God wants us to impact this city, the province or nation, but we must be people of love, unconditional love. Not love by words, but love by actions. We can tell people we love them till we're blue in the face, but if our actions don't show it, they'll never believe it. I remember hearing a story one time, this old couple, they were in about their 70s. They're about my age. <laughs> Guess I have to admit I'm old. <laughs> They're driving along and the wife turns to him and says, honey, do you love me? And he doesn't say a word. He just keeps driving, looking forward. She says it again to him, honey, do you love me? Doesn't say a word. Just keeps driving. Third time she says it, he didn't say a word. She reaches over and just turns off the key. She said, I said, honey, do you love me? He turns and looks to her and says, honey, I said I loved you when I married you and nothing's changed. <laughs> you see, God doesn't want us to be that way. We need to not only express our love to him, but express and demonstrate it to one another. The world needs to see our love. They need to feel our love. We could tell them, be clothed, be filled, be full. And if we don't show them our love and demonstrate that love, they will never, 
ever experience that love. That's why as a church, we have a care fund to help those in need. We have containers outside containing food and containing clothing to help those that need help. God is creating a church that will make a difference, that will impact the world around us. God wants us to practice that ultimate sacrificial love one for another. God's ultimate act of love for us was him to send his son. I believe this morning he wants to demonstrate his love to us. Some of us, we love, but we love the wrong things. We put our focus upon the wrong thing. And the Bible says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And I hate to say this, but some of your treasures are in your children. And the Bible says unless, so it sounds like a hard thing, but unless you hate your father and your mother, your children, how can you love me? But often we put our children or our family ahead of God. God wants our love in every aspect, in every being. He says that when you love him that way, you could go to the ends of the earth and you think you've sacrificed, but you've never sacrificed because he says in this lifetime, I'll bless you with homes, I'll bless you with friends, I'll bless you with families. And I could speak as living on six continents, I could say that I have friends and I have families and I have homes and I have people that are close to me wherever I've gone. And God has always filled the gap with his love. God wants us, to, he's changing our culture that we will be a church that will sacrifice love for the sake of the kingdom of God and touching a world that is perishing without Jesus Christ. Let's bow our hearts this morning. Father, I thank you that you provided the ultimate act of love that even before the worlds were created, you set a plan, you had a plan, and you set it into motion, where that you did not want one person to perish, but you wanted to redeem them. Father, I pray this morning that your love will touch our hearts, that it will change our mindset, it will change our lifestyle, Lord, that we look to please you. Even as Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the Father. Father, that we would choose your will above everything that would want to detract from loving you. Father, I pray that your grace, which will be sufficient for us, will strengthen us in the area of our will. Lord, that we can make a difference in Mulder's Drift, that we can make a difference in this province, that we can make a difference in this nation, and that we can impact the nations of the world with your love. Lord, let us not just speak of your love, but let us demonstrate it in Jesus' name. Amen. His love. Lord, your love. Let your love, let the realization of your love just descend upon us like a cloud. Let the weightiness of your love touch us in the resource, the, the deepest re spots of our being that the resource of your love will overflow from us to those around about us. Give us hearts for the world, Father, for you're not willing that any would perish. Let your goodness come forth in Jesus' name. One last story. I remember taking two young men with me my wife and I did a trip to Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China. We took one young man from Natal who had 
only flown to Cape Town his whole life on a business trip and back to Natal or KwaZulu. The other one had never been out of this province. But they went with me to Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and China. Both men are there some 30 years later. They've been there for 30 years because they saw that God could use them to make a difference. And they just began loving one person at a time. And they realized what they knew was more than an unbeliever knew about Jesus. I'm saying this, that this morning because I believe God is even speaking to some of you to open your heart to the nations so that God can manifest his love through you. Father, we worship you this morning. Lord, we want to lift Jesus' name higher. For your word says that if we lift Jesus up, you will draw all people unto yourself. We extol you this morning, Jesus. We're so grateful that you rose from the dead, that you ascended on high, and that you're interceding for our success. We bless you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen and amen.